um, those of us who are generally deemed to be Eurosceptics in the UK, my organization of the Henry Jackson Society has a, a very wide range of opinions on this matter, and I'm, as I said, one end of that. But um, those of us who take a position, I think, should always stress, so I do now, that in no way do we want the Eurozone to fail. And in no way would we, or are we, any more serious regarding this with any type of glee. Um, being proved right is no fun at all when Armageddon is on the other side of being proved right. Uh, it is no fun at all uh, for a political view to be uh, corroborated uh, at, the extent, at the expense of huge numbers of people's livelihoods, of uh, civil unrest, of political upheaval, and so on. So even as a Eurosceptic, I hope very much that the Eurozone is able to come through this crisis and succeed through it. Um, I think it's important because sometimes people are more inclined to be proved right and to see peace. Um, anyhow, um, I want to make a very short number of points on this matter. The first is this. Uh, the chair mentioned at the outset uh, that one of the objectives of the uh, European Union uh, Eurozone, I might say, is or was to make war between nation states in Europe less likely. Um, and I think it's important to get this right. First of all, one of the reasons why there is more Euroscepticism in Britain than elsewhere uh, is precisely because there is a feeling in Britain that we don't have exactly the same problem as happened on the continent. And therefore, we may feel that we are apart from that. I think there's a perfectly good argument for saying so. But I think also there is a serious misunderstanding at the heart of that view of the virtue of integration, which is, among other things, to mistake what causes war. Um, war may have been, after Westphalia, primarily something that occurred between nation states, but before that, Europe was driven by wars of religion. And uh, I think that the very short view of history has been extrapolated out uh, in Europe in for a long view of history, and I think some of the wrong lessons have been taken. I think that there is a serious problem, and it's something which uh, the EU, with Britain in it, the Eurozone without us in it, has to consider, which is the extent to which this has gone beyond economics, uh, and the extent to which what is happening is driven solely by ideology. I think ideology is a very uh, a good thing in some ways, an exceedingly bad thing in others. I think it's exceedingly bad when it confronts common sense in economics. And I think that you see one example of that among many, many others on the list with Greek entry into the Europe. When, um, when Greece was demonstrably cooking its books, as we would say in Britain, um, why did people not want to see this? Because this was not about economics, this was about ideology. It's about trying to draw as wide a number of people in to a fiscal union as possible. And I think we are seeing very bad results indeed from that trumping uh, of ideology. But I wanted to cite a, a more, even more serious concern which I think needs to be addressed, which is the issue of democratic legitimacy, which has already come up. Um, the, uh, if you look around the world in 2011, uh, it was a, a, an extraordinary year for democratic spread across North Africa. It was an extraordinary year for democratic voices to speak up across the Middle East. It was an exceedingly bad year for democracy in Europe. Um, if even a couple of years before, you had said that there would be a year very soon where democracy failed so badly that in a couple
country like Italy, it would be necessary to go around the democratic process and put in a bureaucrat to sort out the economy. I think that people would have thought you were dreaming, but exactly that situation came along and we accepted it as if um, it wasn't too much of a problem. I think that sometimes things happen in, uh, in, in politics which you don't realize at the time are very significant and, and appear to have been a minor bump and it's only sometime later that you realize it was indeed a very aggressive one. Uh, and I think that that is an example of it. But the second issue is the issue of representation generally in the EU and, uh, and uh, across the continent. Um, I think that as a proponent of democratic politics, as a defender of it, as an advocate of it, and an advocate for spreading democratic politics around the world, the EU currently uh, is an exceedingly bad exemplar of these uh, traits. And I say that again with no, no glee. Uh, the EU has shown itself to be, not, if not incapable, then certainly an institution that finds it exceedingly hard to uh, back up on mistakes. It's an institution that finds it extremely hard not to inevitably spread out to inevitably grow and uh, to metastasize. Um, I would say that this moment in the EU, in the Eurozone crisis in particular, should be one which, if the EU is to survive, it will have to seriously address some of these issues. It will have to address the issue of democratic legitimacy. It cannot, after this, era be acceptable that a foreign minister, for instance, is appointed in a closed group by unelected officials and that the foreign minister in question is somebody that nobody has heard of and nobody has ever voted for. I'm referring to my lamentable uh, countryman, Catherine Ashton, um, somebody who had never been through the democratic process in my country, but somehow is now called the European foreign minister. It, it, I think this is a an issue that should be of serious democratic concern. And I hope I would say that even if I agreed with her politics, uh, which I don't. Um, but just finally, you mentioned, of course, being busy, uh, George's own role in this. I, um, I think there are many, having been rather down on it, but I think there are many things which uh, the membership of the EU uh, can bring many advantages, um, and particularly that it can provide a direction of travel to countries like Georgia that, that wish to be part of um, such a zone and such a union. Um, but I would add one caveat, which is that it, if Georgia is to move in this direction, as I would hope, generally speaking, it does, that it does so in a position which it can itself be constructive within. What I mean by that is, it could have been, you could foresee a situation in which Georgia, with all of the, frankly, miracles that have occurred in, in, in your economic system in, uh, in recent years, in your free market system, it, it, it is perfectly foreseeable that if you were to become uh, involved in, become a member of the EU, that much of that would reverse because uh, much of the liberalization of your markets would be turn backward, much of the regulation come in would hamper, not help uh, that growth. Um, I hope that uh, there are things which uh, can be done which Georgia could be actively a part of and actively able to help Europe again. Um, I said to one of my colleagues in Britain last night, if it were in my gift, I would, I would give Georgia our EU membership. Uh, and you have it, but in fact, uh, what I would rather see is a number of states, Britain included, which work within the EU and work to reform it and precisely to sort out some of the democratic deficit um, which has existed there in recent years. But, and I say as a final point, I see very little likelihood of it succeeding um, because one of the remarkable things that has been coming from Brussels in recent weeks is it seems to me no lessening whatsoever of the 
frankly self-righteous uh, tones in which Russell speak. Um, the, if my house were on fire and I had set light to it myself, I would like to think that I would speak with a degree more humility in telling other people about firefighting procedures. Um, but I don't hear that. And as I say, it would be unlikely it could get much worse than this. So, um, as T.S. Eliot said, humility is endless, but it would be lo lovely to see it start somewhere with that somewhere in Russell. Uh, it was quite interesting to hear uh, that Cassie Aston was appointed by one elected officials. They were the 27 uh, uh, hesitate government in the EU, and as far as I know, they were actually elected. Let me also just say that uh, if you compare, and we were talking about humility here, if you compare the economic situation of the US and the UK with the Eurozone, I think I would like to hear a little bit more humility from Mr. Cameron when he talks about the European and his house and a lot of them. Because if you, for example, make a comparison of Spain, the greatest debt is bigger, the greatest deficit is bigger, inflation is much higher, the economic growth is in the sun. Uh, so, I mean, I think this is much more of a Western world growth problem. And I'll come back to, in a minute, why I think we talk about a euro crisis more than we talk about a dollar crisis or a pound crisis, because I think they're a fairly simple answer to that. But let me also just say that I have uh, um, reacted against the term the euro crisis until last week. Because all the way through this crisis, the euro has been fairly strong and stable to the dollar. Actually, the average rate has been about 130, which I personally think has been uh, ridiculously high and also hurting the competitiveness of Europe. But what has happened over the last 10 days or so is that I think we are talking more about an existential, at least in the imagination of the markets, existential euro crisis because the euro has dropped to, uh, I just checked it for a minute ago, to 123 to the dollar. In my opinion, this is still an, uh, an overvaluation of, of, of the euro and hampers growth in Europe. But I also have to say that the valuation we've seen is not necessarily a good one because it didn't come of the good and natural reasons I would like to. 